Good day, everyone. It's Kevin with VintiqueSound.com, and today we're taking a look at the new Cubase Pro 10.5. There's over 15 new features and improvements that I want to go over in this video, so let's get to it. So new feature number one is the combined selection tools. So this little button, when you activate it, it combines the object selection tool and the range selection tool. So now whenever you hover on the top half of the track area, it becomes the range selection tool. And when you hover on the bottom half of the uh, track area, it's the object selection tool. So I think this is a well-deserved upgrade to the existing tool set. It is much easier than having to switch between the tools. It is very streamlined. And I think I found myself not using the range tool nearly enough, even though it's just a click away. It does make a difference when it's a combined tool it's very easy to hover in the range selection zone, select a range, change the volume automation, uh, hover in different areas, make a bunch of necessary little edits, all on the fly, all without having to change tools. And it makes the entire process just very streamlined. So I'd say that's a welcome change. Number two is the EQ and spectral curve comparison mode. So right now I have the kick drum group channel selected and I'm comparing the EQ curve and spectral frequency with the bass group track. So in blue that's the kick drum and in orange that's the bass group track. And I can click on either one and switch between those two tracks. So I can quickly identify where the masking frequencies are between those two tracks and I can now very visually easily identify where those frequencies are clashing, go in with an EQ and do some adjustments to help prevent frequency masking. And I can easily switch between the two tracks and make necessary adjustments. I can also very easily and quickly solo each track either individually or together and then I can quickly bypass the uh, comparison feature and then just go back to my normal single non-comparison view of a track. So to set this up it's very easy you just select the drop down menu here find whatever track it is you want and click on it. There's an equalizer settings button where you can adjust certain parameters such as holding the post EQ peak curve. Uh, you can also show pre EQ curve, etc. You can sh uh, change the transparency amount. You can change whether these are sliders or knobs. And then you can also remove showing the equalizer controls. So now that I've had some time to play around with this, I've got to say it is a very, very nice feature. I have used, for instance, uh, Isotopes Neutron, which is uh, a plugin that has a similar feature, which is frequency masking. And you can go into the selected track and click on whatever track you want to show masking frequencies. So you can see the orange is the bass and the blue that hovers up is the kick drum. So a very similar feature set, but the immediate downside to this is that you have to have the Neutron plugin on the tracks, on each track, that you want to uh, have this feature for. So two things. One is there's all this extra time involved in adding the plugin to the track and setting it up and going into the plugin, then clicking from the drop down menu. But also, this is taking up a lot more processing power in your project. So, if I wanted to have this masking uh, comparison ability for each and every track, I'd have to go in here and insert that onto each and every track, meaning 
multitude of plugins, and the CPU load would skyrocket. Of course, there are much more features in Neutron than just the masking, but I find I just don't use it very much. It's so much better when the DAW has built-in features that doesn't take the CPU load hit, and that just offers the integrated flexibility and feature set. So, yeah, uh, two thumbs up. I didn't even expect this was going to be a feature, and I am very pleased with it. Number three is the colorized mix console channels. So by default, the backgrounds of the channels are not colorized. You have to activate that in the preferences. But one thing to note is it's now more visually clear which channel is selected because the name section is bright and there's more contrast involved. Prior to this, it would only highlight the background slightly, so it was a little bit more difficult to identify which track was selected. So to customize this, you're going to want to go into Edit, Preferences, under User Interface, Track and Mix Console, Channel Colors. And here you can see what to color the track. I prefer to have the track's default color, and you can choose whether to have it only on the mix console channels, or you can also add it to the project channels themselves. So not just in the mix console, but also on the main project window. And I'll show you that in a second. But if I hit apply on this, you'll see now that all the tracks are colorized. And you can select the color strength, and you can select the brightness at which the track selection uh, brightens the track so you can clearly identify which one is selected. I would prefer something a little less highly colorized and maybe less bright. So yeah, I think the, uh, the default settings are quite good. Uh, so now to show you, in the track areas here, because I've selected all tracks and folder tracks, not just the mix console, it's now colorized this section so that was a much requested feature. Steinberg has delivered, and you can tweak it to your preference. Number four is the export video function. And so to export the video, you would go file, export, and then video. And it is a very basic video export function, of course. The only video format you have is MP4 with H.264 uh, compression. You're only able to export as a stereo audio file. So you would just select your file path, file name, and it gives you a breakdown of the file information. So it has the codec, the format, the resolution, the bit rate, the frame rate, and it also has the breakdown for the audio. So it's an AAC compression type at 16-bit. So for me, even though this is very stripped down basic exporting, I will still find it useful in the future. I don't use Cubase and I don't intend to want Cubase to be my main video editor. I'm not going to use it for transition effects and all these different things. I have a separate editor for that. But there are times when all I need is just a very good audio editor and Cubase excels in that and almost every video editor I've used does not come close to the functionality. Number five, it is the new multi-tap delay plugin. And this features up to eight separate taps. And this thing is uh, very full featured. There is uh, several sets of effects uh, sort of built into it. It's not just a tap delay and nothing more. There's, uh, there's loop effects, there's filter effects, uh, reverb effects, there's a grid aspect. You can randomize taps and you can then quantize to those grids that you've selected. There's character choice between uh, digital modern, digital vintage, tape and whatnot, and then this crazy mode. There's pan between all the taps, there's the volume level. It is very full featured. So I'm gonna start by showing you, I guess, some of the presets 
But here's a slapback dub verb. So I put that on the snare drum and have a listen. So without. So you can hear it's not just a simple static dub delay. There's there's movement in the reverb, there's movement in the filter. It's actually a very impressive uh, tap delay for a DAW to have. And now let's hear on the snare the pumping bass builder. So again, just so much movement in the stereos field, in the filter realm. Uh, reverb and whatnot and the delay aspect of it. So I now put the multi-tap on this what I call wobs. Here's how it sounds without it. Just a very I'd say static or quite static. I, ha I do have Pan Man uh, automating some panning but have a listen with this on. It's probably not what I would use specifically on this bass element in this track, but I could see myself using this multi-tap delay for several like dub style effects, uh, for several sort of background spacey effects to sort of fill in the song with just interesting ear candy and whatnot. So I have here the filtered stereo percussion preset on a hand drum. So again, probably not something I would uh, use in this context on this song, but this type of plugin certainly makes the creative aspect of making music just flourish by taking something that's very static and then just completely changing it in, in many different ways. So if we go into it just a little bit more in depth, there are several, I think there's 14 types of effects that you can choose from. So in the loops effect, in the tap effects, and post effects, all of these are available to you. You have everything from a, a chorus, a phaser, envelope shaper, bit crusher, pitch shifter, delay, auto pan, flanger, vibrato, filter, uh, overdrive, frequency shifter, reverb and a gate. So this ha there's so many possibilities with this. And you can apply each one of these things either on the loop, not the tapped resulting delays, but what's going into the effect or what's going into the plugin. Then you can apply whatever you want to just the resulting tap delayed. And then you can do it to everything on the post effects chain. So this little functional diagram help window explains it all. The loop effects is not affecting the delayed signal. The tap effects is not affecting the loop input signal. It's only affecting the delayed signal. And then the post effects is affecting both. It's affecting everything at the very output of this plugin. So I know that I'm going to have a lot of fun with this plugin. This is kind of a game changer. I've been trying to find that perfect sort of delay plugin that helps me to get a very non-static, just completely out there type of effects. So two thumbs up on that multi-tap delay. And number six, the final new feature is Pad Shop 2 which unifies the original Pad Shop and Pad Shop Pro versions and combines them into one single product. And then it also adds some new features. So if you never invested in Pad Shop Pro, you are now getting a whole bunch of new things, some new features and new content. 
And if you're like me and had the full version of Padshop Pro, you now have access to a few new features. So some of the Padshop Pro features is the ability to drag and drop samples directly into the synth. You also had access to a three band parametric EQ for each layer. It is now expanded to a four band EQ. So the other thing with the Padshop Pro feature that you had access to was a global reverb, which is algorithmic, which is very uh, interesting. So you can get everything from a standard smooth pad to something that's arpeggiated or just has some really crazy features to it. Like that, that's completely non-typical for a pad. And the last thing that's brought in from the Pad Shop Pro is around 50 presets of pads and, and evolving sounds, as they call it. So one of the added new features is a new spectral oscillator. And you have access to the new oscillator by clicking this switch oscillator type button. And you can see the parameters here are a little bit different. It's still using granular synthesis. But there's a, a new high-end uh, time stretching and pitch scaling algorithm. And it appears that the main difference uh, in this oscillator is in the, in the term spectral. That means the algorithm is working completely in the frequency domain. So instead of a conventional time stretcher that works in the time domain, this is working in the frequency domain. And I'm not entirely sure how else to explain it, but let's move on to the next new feature, which is the redesigned arpeggiator section, which is taken from Retrolog 2. And just like the EQ, you have a designated arpeggiator for each individual layer. And so here you have access to several presets I think I'll just choose bass and chord. ARP 11 looks good. Another new feature is the ability to drag and drop a assigned modulation source, such as, let's say I want to have the amplifier envelope as the modulation source. I can click this little symbol here, drag it onto whatever parameter I want to be modulated so you can see as I drag and drop, it's now adding that to the modulation matrix. Another new feature is a third envelope with four bipolar levels and three times, just like in Retrolog 2. There's also two added polyphonic LFOs. And the filter set, uh, all taken from Retrolog 2. And there are 115 new presets available. So that ranges from synth leads to synth pads to sound effects to basses and various other instrument types. All right, so now on to the improvements. And number one, it is the MIDI retrospective recording. So the first thing is the dedicated retrospective recording button that's by default in the transport panel. And all the MIDI editors now also have their own dedicated uh, insert MIDI retrospective recording button. So the biggest difference in this improvement is that each and every MIDI and instrument track now has their own dedicated buffer for capturing MIDI data. And each track has their own dedicated control to insert that buffer data. So you can see on this Retrolog track, I can insert what I previously played without having to actually record anything. I can insert that as a linear recording. I also have the ability to insert as a cycle recording if I had the cycle loop enabled and was running through different takes. So you can see here, it's in all the different lanes, it's inserted all those takes without me ever having to hit the record button. So I just want to throw in some stats in here because this is quite interesting. 
Each and every buffer can capture up to 10,000 MIDI events. So that buffer size allows for around two and a half minutes worth of data. If you had, for instance, 100 tracks, they each have 10,000 MIDI events, and the total amount of data collected would be roughly 320 megabytes. So that's a lot of data being captured in the buffer all behind the scenes. So improvement number two is the import tracks from project. So if you're not familiar, you can import various different track types from a completely different project. Now they've expanded that to support more track types and having uh, more control of those tracks when you're importing them. So here you can see a breakdown of all the different tracks from this source project, which is different. My active project is the one that I've opened up and I can go and select whichever track type I want. These are individual instrument tracks right here with the little keyboard symbol. This is a group track. Here's a folder track so I can import the whole lot. This is an audio track. This is an effects track, a marker track. It also supports MIDI tracks, sampler tracks, video tracks, VCA, and chord tracks. So not on this list of supported tracks is tempo and signature tracks. So one improvement is whenever there is track routing. So for instance, these are all instrument tracks in this other project that are being routed into this group track, which is then routed into this drums group track. Now, whenever I import this whole lot, it's going to retain all of that routing in my new project when I import it. I also have the ability to choose whether it's going to import the events and parts separately from the channel and inspector settings and automation. These can all be imported separately I can also select whether this is going to go to a completely new track or if it's going to go to an existing track in my active project. And there's a handy feature right here, select matching. When I click this, you see these have changed their destination. I already have a track in my active project that is named kick and snare and hats and drums and a folder track named drums, and it's matching them based off of the name. And if I choose it in this way, it will import these tracks to the existing track in my active project. I can then choose to import that in the absolute position, or I can import it at a relative position, or I can select it to be imported at the cursor position and I can select whether the media files will be copied to my new active project location. So I'd say this is quite an improvement for import track features. There's also an improved selection menu for overlapping events, and you access that menu from either event in the bottom middle hand point, and you just click which event is going to be uh, the one that's selected. The send level names now include the actual name of the send target. So here you can see it's being sent to the compressor send gain. Instead of just saying send gain, it's displaying the actual target and the target is the compressor. And this is also an improved visual component for automation selection. For different parameters and for quick controls as well that's true or track lists and for also the generic remote and now whenever you open multiple projects in one instance of cubase it no longer automatically activates that newly opened project you have sole discretionary control over which project gets activated or not the glue function is now in the edit menu. So it's not just a tool in the tool menu, 
you also have the ability to go into the edit menu and select glue from there. You're now able to use peak normalization or loudness normalization when you're trying to normalize in the direct offline processing. So instead of telling the system that you want it, for instance, at minus three decibels, you can select it to normalize based off of a loudness function. So let's say I wanted it at streaming level loudness at minus 14 LUFS. You now have access to more track types in this drop down menu when using the add track function. And you now have the ability to name a folder track when you're adding tracks. And you may or may not like having the ability to activate or deactivate the psycho loop function by clicking the top of the locators. It is now something you can toggle on or off in the preferences under uh, transport here. It's clicking locator in range in upper part of the ruler activates cycle. So if I deactivate this, that means whenever I click up here, it's no longer changing that cycle value. Next is the ability to rename the favorites in Media Bay and Media Rack. So whenever I select a favorite, it was always the case that you can name that collection. But once it was made into a favorite, you were never able to rename it. So now just simply right click on your favorite and click the rename. They've now redesigned several windows to create consistency throughout the program. And some of those windows are the profile manager here, backup project window, the add and organize workspace window, the setup windows for the track controls, the inspector and the toolbar settings, and the generate harmony voices. And lastly, there's a whole host of improvements to the score editor. So I'm not familiar or proficient enough in the score editor to actually demonstrate all these changes, but you can have a look through the list of uh, improvements and uh, decide for yourself. And there's also a safe start mode that deactivates third-party plugins when you hold down Shift-Alt when starting the application on a PC. Uh, for a Mac, that would be Option plus Control. You'll be prompted by a safe mode window that you then just choose your preference when starting the, the software. So that is it for the updates for Cubase 10.5. It's not a huge update. I think uh, some people may have wanted more based off of the suggestions that have been made in various posts online, in forums and whatnot, and social media. But overall, I'd say there's a few features that are pretty spot on. The EQ and spectral curve comparison mode, the combined selection tool, the colorize mix console channels, and the multi-tap delay. I'd say those are some pretty significant upgrades, not to mention everything else I've covered in the video. So thank you for watching. If you like that video, hit the like button. And if you want to see more Cubase related videos, then hit that subscribe button because I do cover Cubase and Steinberg products quite heavily in my channel, and there will be many more to come in the future. So take care and bye-bye.